Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. Almost lost track of the time, but I think that we're still on time today. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in beautiful, sunny, not a cloud in the sky, Hernando County. And with me today is one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Bernie. Good morning, Bernie. How are you? Good morning, Bill. I'm doing great. Good, good. Bernie's kind of been like my regular co-host. And I guess our newest regular co-host, Colby, is the new Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator here in Hernando County. So good morning, Colby. How you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing great. Uh, keeping busy, um, doing paperwork and all kinds of other stuff this morning. Almost lost track of the time. But we try to be on here every Thursday morning if possible and we almost always achieve that and we are here to help answer any lawn and garden questions you have so if you're watching us live go ahead and put your question in the chat and we'll go ahead and do our very best to answer it and if we can't figure out an answer we'll ask other people and we'll get an answer for you one way or the other so okay it looks like we got at least a few people on here this morning and good morning, Bill. How are you? And Cindy's here from Pinellas County. Hopefully fairly dry Pinellas County today as opposed to a week or so ago. Um, I know that here in Hernando County, we suffered a lot of coastal flooding right over along the coast in uh, Hernando Beach area and a lot of people's yards and landscapes and trees and bushes and lawns and everything got covered in salt water for a little bit until the water moved back out. And I know that they're in the process of, you know, tending to their houses and trying to get things repaired. Um, I realized though, that University of Florida does not have an awful lot of information on what to do when you become flooded with salt water. Bernie, have you ever tried looking that up or, or have you ever gotten any questions about that? No, I, no, I haven't. Uh... That's kind of interesting. Somebody uh, apparently out there needing something. So uh, Teresa is going to take care of them, I believe. Okay. Yeah, because um, I'm looking into working with a couple. I've contacted a couple specialists at University of Florida yesterday to find out who are the experts on dealing with salt water. So, for example, if you live right along the coast, and that could be in Hernando Beach, that could be in Crystal River, that could be Pinellas County, wherever. And you were flooded, let's say, with a foot of salt water for 24 hours, and then it all drains away. Will it kill your lawn? Will it kill your oak tree? How about your magnolia tree? What will it do to your landscape plants? If you have a queen palm, will it die? But if you have a sylvester palm, will it die? Will it do okay? I honestly don't know the answers to all those specific, you know, plants and their salt tolerances. I know you can look them up individually, but there's no kind of, I, I'm going to put together a couple of um, uh, videotaped either live classes coming up hopefully soon or recorded ones to give people a little bit of guidance on the coast about after the waters are gone, what's going to live. What's going to die and what should I do or not do to help things live and not die? When you look up a lot of those salt tolerances, it, it's it's more like that's giving you information. Oh, if I have this much salt in my soil already, if I'm this much on the coast, I normally have this much salt. That's the information you're getting. You're not really getting what happens if I have a sudden influx of a whole lot more salt than what's normally there. And I, I mean, I couldn't tell you. I don't I don't even I don't even know where to where to begin there. Because I know freshwater flooding inland, certain plants can tolerate that. And mm -hmm. other plants, if they sit in standing water for 24 hours or more, things don't look good for them. There's a very, very good chance they're going to die in usually one to three years. You know, not immediately necessarily, but further down the road, they're going to die, especially trees. But when it comes to, uh, and I found a few blog posts and if you look up University of Florida information on individual like oak trees, magnolia trees, uh, gardenias, whatever it might be in your yard, it tells you that it's salt tolerant, definitely not salt tolerant, 
kind of salt tolerant, but doesn't really. Just if you dig long and hard, there's there's the information out there. It's just not guidance all mm. in one spot. And I realized like we need to do a couple classes on that. So I'm working on it. If you live right on the coast and you need that information, we're working on getting it to you. I uh, spilled some uh, water softener salt about six months ago. Cleaned it up best I could, and uh, it it took about three weeks before I saw any any problem. And and finally, everything in that area died, and it's still bare. I mean, it's now about five months, and no weeds have come back in that area. So. Uh, <laughs> It's it's definitely damaging to plant life. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like uh, the rains that we've had eventually it'll flush it out, and it's and it's in a spot where it really doesn't make any difference. It's near the entrance, and it just looks like traffic could worn that spot out. But the truth is, it's some idiot that's built salt. Hey, that happens, I guess. The, uh, the spot that I spilled my water softener salt at my house is, uh, there, there, there's nothing there. It's, it's, it's yellow. <laughs> I'm not the only one. I feel better. <laughs> so, Bernie, are you familiar with Manuka trees? No, I'm not. I'm not really familiar with them either. Um, Apparently, it's very valuable for beekeepers. So, Teresa, I see that you're on here today. If you are familiar with Manuka trees, feel free to chime in. Um, here. Let's look it up. I believe I've heard of a Manuka tree. Australia, New Zealand, maybe. Here it is. It um, some information in some a blog post. It's also called a broom tea tree, a manuka myrtle, New Zealand tea bush, New Zealand tea tree. Um, let's see. Um, it is hardy to this area, USDA zone 9A and 9B. So it should grow and do well in central Florida. Much further north of that, it looks like it will die. So it's only good in zones 9, 10, and 11. Um, it says this plant is attracted to bees, butterflies, and birds. So obviously it flowers and the flowers are attractive to wildlife. Um, blooms repeatedly. Prefers mildly acidic soil, 6.1 to 6.5. So you may want to get a um, soil test to make sure that you're, you know, at least in the right neighborhood there. But yeah, it's one that I'm not familiar with, but apparently will grow here. With the uh, with the zones, what are the? Uh, maybe that might be something to explain where, like, like what what zone is local to uh, Hernando County and maybe some other parts of Florida. I know around here, what what are we, nine? It's like the range in the nines uh, for Hernando County. We're at, we're in an awkward position. We're 9A, mm -hmm. but we have warmer summers and colder winters than, than we should. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to take that into account. We're, we're the, the transition point mm -hmm. and uh, things that do well in Pasco County become iffy in Hernando. Things that do well in Ocala can become iffy in Hernando County. So uh, if, if you want something that really is going to work, you want something that's rated zone eight through zone 10, because we get that range. Uh, and in a, in a four or five year period, we cover all those the mm -hmm. conditions in a, in a very severe way. So, uh, you know, you're, you're liable to lose something to severe cold or severe heat. Mm. Yeah. The, the zones are really yes. uh, kind of gray areas sometimes. They are. A little bit. And you can see on this map here that I went ahead and pulled up. 
If you go, if you just Google USDA hardiness zone map, they have an interactive map and you can put in your zip code and then it will tell you exactly which zone you're in. The funny thing about this is a good part of Hernando County is right on the line between zone 9A and 9B. And the closest that I can normally find on here, see if we zoom in a little bit more and it doesn't have, it does have towns listed here. <laughs> Look at that. I live in Spring Hill, so I am right on the line. So I guess technically more zone B by a couple blocks than 9A technically, but um, a lot of Hernando County, the line goes right through Hernando County basically. So it's kind of part and part. Doesn't make a really huge difference. There's not many plants that are gonna grow in one and definitely not the other. More tropical things will do better in 9B. More temperate things a little bit better in 9A. A lot of plants, if you look at the label or the information, it says it grows well in 9A or 9B. But it's right there online. If you want to Google that you get, for somebody who's not sure where they are on a map, if you just go ahead and put in your zip code, it'll tell you which zone you're in although for my zip code is probably going to show half and half because of our terrain the uh the extreme western part of the county tends to be a little warmer in the winter so the uh, golf does give us some buffer effect in the winter and uh, we we tend to have some some microclimate uh things occur uh in the hillier areas where uh, maybe somebody on one street can can do anything they want for zone 9a and and the next peep was too cold or or uh, vice versa and you you just can't predict those things so uh i i ride a motorcycle and when i'm, I'm out in uh, the the fall when it, it's just getting to the point where uh, you may or may not need a jacket and i'm riding without a jacket when you hit one of those cold spots, I mean, it, it'll drop six or seven degrees mm -hmm. in a block and then come back up in another block. So if, if you're in that little area, uh, things just really don't do well. So you want to grow papaya and it absolutely doesn't work. And your neighbor's got them all over the place and it's giving <laughs> them to you because they're like zucchini. They can't get rid of them quick enough. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it confuses people and uh, make, makes it difficult to to tell people exactly what they can or can't you you get these things right on the, the transition you just want to be careful when you recommend it if you know it's a transition rated plant yeah we always try to recommend um plants that are going to have a high degree or high chance of success here so in theory, you can grow apples here in Central Florida, and one out of what do you think, a hundred people may be Maybe. successful with it. <laughs> yeah. But we're not really going to recommend that because only one out of maybe a hundred people that actually buy spend money on an apple tree are going to be successful and happy with it. So that's kind of a, a low. low that one person you told is going to think you're a genius, though. <laughs> yeah. Avocados are that way. There, there, are, there are some mm -hmm. spots in the county with great success in avocados, and other spots where they die as fast as you plug them in the ground. So, it, you know, it, it I, those things are not predictable. So, if, if you're planting something uh, and it it gives you zone A is the absolute farthest north, you know, it's a nine A, B, ten, eleven plant. It, it becomes iffy in a lot of spots in the county. So you really need to, to keep that in mind. Don't don't tell people that, yes, absolutely, this will work. Explain to them that it, it may be iffy at, at that point. There's, yeah. there's some trees that were far enough south. Uh, they, they work most places in the county, but they don't work every place in the county. So. Again, to make it more complicated, 
for things that grow well up north and you're trying to figure out just how far south will they grow, you'll see in a catalog that it grows to um, zone 9A or 9B. Keep in mind that goes across the country. That includes California also. So I got a question about a tree. It wasn't an ash tree, but it was definitely a northern kind of tree. I'm thinking, well, that doesn't grow here. So I looked up the exact variety, and sure enough, it grows in zone either 9A or 9B in California. And that's where it's native to. And our weather is not like California at all, ever. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to make sure it's like Florida 9A and 9B. Yeah, and, and if you're going to plant something that grows in 9A, and this is the, the farthest south that it goes, uh, you don't want to buy it from a Michigan nursery. Uh, you want to buy it, if at all possible, from a nursery here in the state, or at worst case, maybe Georgia or uh, South Carolina. But the farther north, north you go, the more acclimated uh, that plant is to being in cold weather and not warm weather and and the less chance you have of it growing here so uh th these people that bring plants uh, when they move here uh, a lot of times even though the plant could survive if it was a, a local nursery purchase uh, the acclimated plant from pennsylvania or new york just doesn't survive here let's go through a couple of comments and questions here good morning Andrew Dave how are you um and she asks that she has some curled up leaves on the top of her peppers and fire spikes a little bit also and the hummingbirds are not happy um the eggplants are not producing eggplant what happens is as the days get shorter and things cool off ever so slightly, like they're starting to right now, your peppers and eggplants will perk back up and they should start flowering again and setting fruit. So if you have eggplant that survived the summer, it should start to perk up soon and you can get another crop of eggplants. Same with peppers. They're not really happy during the scorching hot summer, but once it cools off just a little bit, you kind of get another flush and you can get another crop off of them. And, you know, we couldn't do this without Teresa. I tell people I would be lost. I'd just be trying to figure out my paperwork and not accomplishing anything without Teresa. So thank you. And Anne-Marie is going to have to send me some Manuka honey sometime so we can all check it out. Good morning, Diana. How are you? And I think Tavares is 9A. Should be. I think you're right. Yeah. Tavares is uh, 5 to 10 degrees warmer than we are. They're, they're, they're more of a 9A than we are. Yeah, right we, Right here, we're right. Most of us are right on the line or very, very close to it. They, they've got some big moderating water areas up there, so kind of interesting that there's usually a, an eight to 10 degree difference between here and Orlando. Uh, yeah. Orlando's a little cooler, but in the winter, they're a little warmer. So uh, they, they get by with some plants we can. Phyllis, good morning. Great to have you watching us. Uh, Bill asks about the American Horticulture Society's heat zone map. I'm not too familiar with that, but that shows kind of the opposite of what the other zone map shows. The other one shows the average low temperature, and the heat zone map shows the average highest temperatures. So they're both very important. It both gives you a idea of what potentially happens in where you live, depending on what zones you're in, and what your best plant choice is going to be your best chance for success. We used to have a horde agent that uh, really believed in that uh, heat zone map. And uh, a lot of times uh, when you're trying to explain to somebody why there's a problem, he would pull that out. And it was amazing the, the 
where it would pick up things that, that you would miss. So it's definitely something that uh, if you're wanting to be a, a really great gardener, professional gardener, uh, keep it in mind. It, it's definitely worth looking at. And Corey's just south of us in Pasco. He's in a cold spot. I know some people are. Diana has a question here. Can I plant cool weather seeds in our sandy soil like carrots? Or should I always make a good soil mix and use containers or a raised bed? Also would love to grow dill. How does that do here? Thank you. Very easy. You can grow carrots in fairly sandy soil or carrots grow well in a container and carrots grow well in a raised bed also. Just have to make sure the soil is loose and there's no rocks. That's something you don't really have to worry about here in Central Florida. We don't have a whole lot of rocks in the soil unless it's leftover construction materials or something like that. And you can grow carrots. You can plant them starting really now. I try to wait till beginning of October. And dill, dill is one of the herbs that does really, really well here if you grow it during the winter. So get some dill seeds and start them now and grow your dill all winter long and pick it and dry it and enjoy it. And if it's still around and growing next spring, once it starts to get hot, you're probably going to get these great big fat striped caterpillars on it, but they turn into beautiful swallowtail butterflies. So you're going to leave them and you're going to give them the leftover last of the dill. So go ahead. I, I need to start my dill. Gosh, really soon. I need. I don't want to forget that because I like dill. Um, you could dry it. Very easy to dry, and you end up with your own dill. You know, you go to the grocery store. You look at the prices on dried herbs. The little jar of you oh. know this and that, and oh my gosh. Sage. I looked a while back, and it may have changed, but it was like four dollars for a little jar. I'm thinking I should grow my own. <laughs> We just moved um, and took and and we got rid of a bunch of uh, the spices and seasonings and stuff that we had. And we went and bought a lot of dried herbs. And I the, that was the most expensive grocery. And we did all of our groceries, but that on top. And I was like, Lordy, that's bad. <laughs> Some are cheap. Salt and pepper are pretty cheap. Some of the other herbs are <sighs> ridiculously expensive. And then you're wondering... Is there a worldwide shortage of sage for some reason that I didn't see about in the news? Or um, We have a question from Andrew Dave about mangoes and what is the best timing for fertilizing mango trees? She had about nine Hayden mangoes, I guess, over in Tavares. Wanted to do grafting on the mango trees. Any website for looking up information? University of Florida has a lot of information on mangoes, and I'm sure Teresa will share um, links to them in just a moment. Uh, I'm not sure when the best time of year to do grafting on them is, but mangoes are about to go, you know, they don't go dormant, they go quiescent. That is today's vocabulary word, quiescent. And that's what tropical plants do during the winter or during adverse growing conditions, they just quit growing and they sit there and they don't do a whole heck of a lot. As long as they don't freeze, if they freeze, all the leaves fall off and they start to look really, really bad. So uh, really right now would be the last time that you want to fertilize for this year. And then you really don't need to fertilize them again until spring because they're not going to grow much, if at all, over the winter here in Central Florida. Um, anybody watching this in South Florida, your timing is different on that because your mangoes and tropical fruits grow year round. They slow down in the winter, but they still keep growing. So your advice is gonna be a bit different, but here in Central Florida, yeah, the last time for fertilizing your palms and a lot of your different fruits and your citrus and everything is gonna be maybe October at the latest. And yes, some parts of California are Mediterranean weather, and Florida is subtropical weather. Very, very different. One of the uh, things that I spent a lot of time on in school with um, studying invasive plant species is the correlation of 
your latitudes. So you have a lot of invasions that will come across the entire hemisphere, but will be a similar latitude. And that's because the climates are similar as you go up and down further away from the uh, equator. So it's kind of interesting if you look at plants that are native to similar latitudes that will grow here. Yep. And if you look at any of our uh, popular fruits like mangoes come from parts of Southeast Asia and India, citrus comes from China, all these different fruits have some place in the world they're native to. Mm -hmm. And once we discover them, we just draw a line around the globe and drag them all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's the same with the invasive species. We have a old world climbing fern here that's yep. native to uh, Southeast Asia ish. And it is terrible and it grows very well in Florida. <laughs> yeah. Diana asks about the uh, zone. That's 9A. That's that's a pretty good 9A, uh, true 9A for the county. So that's not a bad spot. Yeah, in rural highlands, you're going to want to build up your soil. You need to get organic matter or make compost or buy compost and build up your soil. And things can grow just fine there. It's just naturally very, very, very little organic matter. And sometimes really unusual pHs. I've gotten guys a really, yeah. a really unusual soil test reports where I'm looking at the numbers like, how that happened? Amory has Tupelo honey in winter for the, the bees forage from the Tupelo trees in the swamp areas when most of the flowers are gone in winter. The honey is darker and more nutritious. Teresa is probably jealous because Teresa is a beekeeper also and has bees. Summer honey is lighter. I couldn't grow a Manuka tree, but would be great for those who can't. You're probably technically too far north. My guess is a Manuka tree would freeze and die in the winter up where you are. Um, in Australia, Manuka honey is prized and considered medicinal. Teresa, we're going to have to look at getting some Manuka trees and bring your bees in and make honey out of it. So another little project. And there's Teresa with a link to the uh, USDA hardiness zones. And that shows the average low temperature range for where you live, which is going to limit what you can grow and what you can't grow. And yeah, Teresa uh, says her honey is dark from Biden's Alba, and she likes that one the best. So, so see, we're covering a little bit of everything here today. Mm -hmm. And I told Bernie earlier that I have a couple pictures here to share with everybody. Uh, kind of a, a, a little segment, I guess we should talk, start doing on a regular basis from digging in Dr. Bill's email. So these are things that I was emailed. And let's start with a kind of easy one here. This, oh, we're going to have problems seeing that one. Um, let me think, what's the easiest way for me to pull this up? Give me a second and I'll go ahead and um, see if I can't pull that up. That was a question. Somebody sent in a picture of a tree that has some fruit on it and they thought it was cherries, but it's not cherries because we do not have cherries here in Florida. Uh, we have, Bernie, what is a cherry laurel and the native black cherry, which are both mm -hmm. very good wildlife plants. A little too far north for Robetus cherry, but some people do that. Sorry, let me scroll along here and see if. You know, I, I had those uh, pictures this morning. Uh, a woman had three citrus trees that uh, she suspected greening and unfortunately uh pretty sure it is greening uh the trees had the uh yellow stripe in the trees 
and the leaves had the uh, mottled effect that you get when you have greening. And uh, unfortunately, if you have citrus, you're probably going to have greening. It, it is just devastated citrus in the entire state to the point where uh, we really can't recommend that you buy citrus. The, the only one that uh, is tolerant uh, at this point it seems to be the uh, sugar bell. And uh, other than that, uh, all those trees yeah. are susceptible. So don't spend $100 for a citrus tree because the odds are it's not going to survive. Yeah, I couldn't open the picture of the persimmon. And that's what it ended up being was a, a wild native persimmon tree, which does get fruit. And wildlife absolutely loves to eat the fruit, but it's not a cherry. So it's not a, a, a Florida cherry or anything. Uh, here, I do have something that kind of ties in with the pictures that were sent to Bernie. And tell me if these are the same pictures that were sent to you. Lady sent in a picture of her, her Myers lemon tree, and it had this, and it has this. So, Bernie, what is that? I can't really see it. You're going to make me put on my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> that is an easy one. The little squiggly lines of, it looks like wax. That is, oh, I, I started to say it, it looks like um, leaf miner on the, the right side. But um, we got some bugs right there on our little tree. Okay. Yes, it looks like classic pictures of Asian citrus psyllid, which is very bad because that's the insect that vectors citrus greening. So, I mean, there's no guarantee that those are carrying citrus greening, but they could be. And if they feed on your tree, they're going to infect your tree, and then there's a very good chance that you're going to get greening. So that's not a good situation to be in. Well, it's not it's not showing anything in the leaf yet. Wonder what the rest of the tree looks like. Did they send you any other picture? Uh just just these two pictures, just this one and this one. And okay. it, it, it's showing a little yellowing. Yeah, but I mean there could be just the, normal um, nutrient deficiency or you know old leaves and a lot of different things. Uh, that that picture looks like the beginnings of greening symptoms. That could be, yeah. So citrus greening is a disease of citrus, and there is no cure for it. It's spread by these tiny little insects. You can see what they look like sitting there on the leaf. And when they feed on your leaf, they poke into it and suck out the juices. And then when they poo... They make the little squiggly lines of it. Almost looks like a white waxy substance. So I need to email her back today. That's not a good situation to be in. And Teresa posted a link to citrus greening information for a homeowner and a little information on Blackberries and Diana, yeah, you probably have cherry laurels. They're really, really common. They tend to grow in clumps. You don't have one. You have like a whole patch of them. Uh, they're great for bees in the spring, and they do make berries, and the birds eat the berries and love them and appreciate them. And... Here's a question about a tree that we don't have a lot of here, but we have a few. River birch tree. So Carolyn uh, wants to know how to get rid of a river birch tree that has branches, most of the tree over the property fence, and the roots are getting in the flower bed. Probably well, that's, to cut down if you want to get rid of it. Yeah. That, that's pretty much cut it off and, and treat it. Yeah, that's one if you don't treat the stump, you will have more river birches coming up everywhere. So uh, if, if you cut it down, you've got about five minutes to uh, treat the stump, 
triclopyr or Roundup mm -hmm. uh, concentrate. Do it immediately. If you wet the tree seal up, uh, it won't do any good. Cherry laurel is the same same way. It is the most amazing. If you have a cherry laurel tree and you go out there with a chainsaw and cut it down, you will only make it angry and you will end up with 30 little sprouts and they'll keep sprouting and you'll be out there battling and battling. So after you, if you want to get rid of it, after you cut it down, you have to spray with an herbicide. So it takes it in and kills the roots and you have to be diligent. It's going to take some work, but eventually you can get rid of it. Yeah, put it in a spray bottle and, and carry it around wherever you take the uh, chainsaw because a lot of those trees that you need to get rid of uh, tend to need to be treated. So, uh, mm -hmm. and, and a spray bottle is the easiest way to do it, simplest way to carry the chemical around. Read the label on the chemical too. That mm -hmm. People get in more trouble uh, I don't know everything there is. No, and they go out there and they're bare feet and, and they're uh, cut offs and no eye protection or anything and, and just spray anything and anywhere and uh, you, you just get in trouble. So, you know, if, if, if the chemical you're using says you need some special protection, they mean it. And, mm -hmm. and you really ought to do those things. So. Also, if you don't use the herbicide according to the label, it may just not work. Um, there's several. So before this, funny enough, I was uh, vegetation management at Swift Mud, and I've used every herbicide under the sun. Um, and if like something, if you take like method and you spray method on the bark of a tree, it's not going to do anything. You have to follow what the label says to do, which is, you know, cut a dividend to it. Um for that river birch tree, that's also a good option is uh, to kill it after you cut it down. Um, a little bit of method, it's really super concentrated, so you don't need much. Um, and if you're only doing one tree, you can buy pretty small amounts of uh, method 240SL. Bernie, here we have a question on one of your favorite topics, turf grass. Bill wants to know when is a good time to add plugs or sod pieces to a lawn where he has a couple of dead spots that need to be filled back up. Well, if you're going to use sod, sod's fine. Do it now. If you're going to use plugs, um, I would wait and do them um, probably in late February. As soon as it gets warm and it looks like it's going to be nice, uh, go ahead and, and, and start the plugs. There's no, no advantage to starting them now. Uh, because the, the lawn's going to go dormant. It's not going to have a time, much time to uh, peg in and start running. Uh, sod pieces, big pieces, uh, will peg quicker than the uh, plugs will. And uh, you can put those down because uh, you've got another m month or so of growing season. But uh, I, I, would, I would wait put the plugs in in the spring. And, and the plugs, by the way, should give you about 18 inches of growth over a year, over a season. So uh, if you can plug every 36 inches, they just about reach at the end of the season here. Just make sure they don't dry out because yeah, they're that's... very, very, because it's just a little, little plug. They're very prone to drying out. And if it dries out, a lot of times they die and they don't come back. By the same token, if you seed uh, bahia, the, the same thing applies. The, the seed is so small, it has no reserve whatsoever. If it dries out, it dies. So yeah. uh, you, you need to keep it damp. Uh, I, I recommend dampening it two or three times a day. You don't have to water. You don't, you don't need water. All you need is enough to keep it damp. So Yeah, just enough to get that surface wet. Yeah. And the best time to sow pepper seeds today. If you want to squeeze in a fall crop, plant the seeds right now and hope that we don't have any early freezes this winter. Some years we'll have a terrible freeze by Thanksgiving. Other years it is beautiful and fairly warm and not cold and no freezes until after Christmas. And I have no idea what's going to happen this year. Well. 
three out of five years we don't get a freeze until after Christmas. Bernie, any idea what Diana's white things crawling in her potted herbs and plants could be? Boy, that could be a bunch of things. Um, and potted plants, potted herbs, um, probably, uh, Spence said, would be probably as easy uh, without identifying the plant or without identifying the insect. Um, you know, the, the white things, you know, that could be mealy bugs. That could be a lot of things. But uh, a good broad spectrum, non injurious uh, would be spinosad. Um, and I can't think of the, the word, the one that's made from plants. But Neem? No, the. Um, oh, well. Pyrethroid? Yeah, pyrethroid. Pyrethroid. Yeah, yeah, pyrethrin would work for a wide variety of things. If you can get a good picture, go ahead and email me a picture when you get a chance. And, you know, if we can figure out what it is from that, we're happy to help. But you can always take a sledgehammer like seven or one of those things and get rid of it. Uh, and I didn't really mean that. Don't don't oh. do that. Don't take don't take seven to your potted plants. <laughs> And they're smaller than mealy bugs, and she might be sending Teresa a picture. So, so Anne Marie switched sweet potatoes from one raised bed to another. Thought the bed they're in was cleaned out. Seems now I have two beds of sweet potatoes. If you leave a little bit behind, it will survive and come back. That could be a good thing if you want to grow them every year in the same spot. You know, whether even if you don't want sweet potatoes in that spot again the next year, a few are going to pop up. Uh, it's better to do crop rotation with it, though. Um, yeah, you 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 technically want to rotate them and not grow them in the same bed year after year. So what you could do is pick out which bed you're going to grow them in. Purchase your starts online. Start your own from grocery store sweet potatoes. When you harvest sweet potatoes, if you save the little tiny ones that are just too big of a pain to try to cook and eat, you can plant, you can save them to plant the next year. So you don't really have to go out and buy them every year. You can kind of grow your own sweet potato starts for the next year. And then whatever pops up in the bed that you don't want it growing in, you can carefully dig that up and put that in the one that you do. And Aunt Susan has a China berry. Yeah, China berries are a big, nasty, invasive mm -hmm. pain in the butt tree here in Central Florida. Um, <laughs> tree guy told me to use a bag of refined white sugar on the stump. I can't imagine why. Um, I'm not... I, was he a certified arborist? Because I am. And I'm not sure why he would recommend sugar. Colby, does sugar I, I, have herbicidal properties? No, but I think the school of thought is that you put sugar in to something like that that you've recently done damage to, and it speeds up fungal and bacterial growth because they're eating the sugar. I don't know how much that actually – I don't know how much – like truth there is to that. Uh, I've heard people say it works. I've heard people tell me while I was at Swift Mud that I need to do that instead of spraying the herbicide. But I know what does work 100% of the time trying to kill a china berry tree. Depending on the size, uh, if it's small enough that you can cut it down with a machete, you just you cut it down and then you spray. Method 240SL is one that w we typically used for china berry trees um but if it's too big to cut all the way down with a machete you can cut down to about you know an inch or two into the into the trunk and spray it just coat that area where you cut in with that method and it will a hundred percent take care of the china berry tree the thing is I'm, a lot of people are really worried about herbicides but if you use them according to the label 
they are not harmful to the environment. But you have to use them according to the label. There's been millions of dollars spent and a whole lot of testing done so to, to, to make sure that they're not harmful. So don't don't just disparage using her herbicides uh, just because they're herbicides. Very good. I know China berries. Um, I have a lot of them in Spring Hill in the empty lots right around me. I have honestly never really heard about using white sugar. I guess that makes sense to increase the bacterial action to break it down. Mm -hmm. But I would think, and so with Susan's China berry, maybe if he had just cut it down and done nothing, it wouldn't have come back. Because not all trees re-sprout. Hmm. Some do, and some, like, do a lot. Um, Brazilian pepper, cherry laurels, a few others sprout a lot if you just cut the one tree down. So, it depends. See, sweet, uh, Teresa put up some information on growing sweet potatoes here. Sweet potatoes, if you grow them during the summer... And you have to grow them during the height of summer when it's really, really hot and steamy out there. And you're thinking, like, I can't grow any vegetables during from June till August. Grow sweet potatoes. Every time I've grown them, I've gotten at least some sweet potatoes. And if I actually put a little bit of effort into it and grow a bunch, I end up with a bunch of sweet potatoes. So guaranteed, guaranteed winner. You're going to get something out of it for your trouble. So, guys, I think it's getting kind of close to that time here. Let me go ahead and share a few things with you. If you have any pictures or questions, you're more than welcome to shoot me an email. It may take me a day or two or during a really, really bad week, three days to get back to you with an answer. Uh, sometimes with plant IDs, I send them off to UF. But they get back with me usually within an hour or two at the most. So I can tell you what that plant is. Send pictures. Lots of pictures. No such thing as too many pictures. We can do a lot with pictures. We can answer a lot of questions that way. If you're interested in attending any of our classes, the vast majority of them are online. And we do things on Facebook Live. We do things on Zoom. We do things like on StreamYard, like what we're doing right now. All different ways. If you bookmark and go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, that's a listing of all of our upcoming classes that we have. And Colby, I think that if you make a Facebook event and I share it on our page, it will show up on there. Okay. Not guaranteed, though. It's one of those weird internet things. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And it takes 24 hours for it to cycle through and show up there. Okay. It's technically through a WordPress plugin. Mm -hmm. I'm not the website expert. Other people are. <laughs> but that way you can keep on top of all of our classes coming up. Um, if you'd like to call and speak with Teresa, there is our office phone number. If you'd like to swing by the office with a leaf or a bug or uh, a citrus fruit or whatever the question might be, Bernie is here pretty much all day long on Thursdays. So swing by, give us a call, swing by on a Thursday. You can meet Bernie live and in person and ask him your questions. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we have? Our Hernando County Master Gardeners operate a small nursery which is, here's the address it's on Oliver Street in Brooksville. It is located right behind the Hernando County Fairgrounds, right along State Road 41. They are there Saturday morning and Wednesday morning, from 8:30 in the morning until 11. When it cools off a bit more, they're open till noon during the winter, but it's still a little too hot. I'm just I'm waiting for them to send me an email saying they're going to be open till noon. But right now, you got to be there before 11. They have a great selection of florida friendly plants native plants very very few trees so if you're looking for trees pine trees oak trees this and that they really don't have any and very very few edibles also but a great place to go and check out buy a couple plants 
And if you would ever like to uh, watch any of our recorded classes, Hernando County Government has a YouTube channel. A lot of my class, my classes, when I do them and record them, always end up there eventually. And our previous Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Lily Browning, has well over 100 classes recorded on there. So it's a great resource. Great way, if, if you're a new resident to Hernando County, great way to kind of get started with gardening, give you some ideas. What can I grow? What can I not grow? Rhododendrons are not going to do well here. Peonies are not going to do well here. Lavender does not do well here. So a lot of those northern plants, you may want to rethink before you start ordering a full bunch from a catalog. And so, one of the things that, that I feel really bad about people buying are, are the things with needles. You know, that you, you, drew, you grew Christmas trees up north and it worked. And unfortunately, just about that entire family of plants does not do well here. It uh, develops fungal and, and primarily fungal problems. And they, they just don't survive. So... Uh, some do. I mean, there's enough of them around that, that people get the impression that it's a great plant. But uh, it's like whale and cypress. Uh, there were thousands of those sold as windbreaks. But they very, very seldom uh, can you put in a, a row of whale and cypress and, and have 10% uh, of them not dead in the first 10 years and all of them dead in 20 years. So there, there's a relatively short-lived plant and they're expensive the, the the furs are that way that the you know any anything that looks like a christmas tree with one exception and that that's the uh, northern red cedar uh, it does very well here but the the rest of those guys shouldn't even be for sale and and the problem is all of these commercial companies are buying plants to sell uh, in an area. So uh, if, if the area happens to be Florida, Georgia, uh, Alabama, and South Carolina, there will be plants at, at the chain stores that just shouldn't be sold in Hernando County. They might work fine in the Panhandle. They might work great in Georgia, but they're not going to work great here. And and. Please save your money. Don't buy evergreen trees of any type unless you do a lot of research. So, And if you need help with that, just contact us. And we got time for one last quick question here from Jacqueline from Lake Santa Fe. She has fire ants, and she's not happy with the... Uh, over-the-counter stuff from the big box stores. They just kind of move around to another spot. And I see Teresa's already thrown a link up there from University of Florida about how to deal with fire ants. So any wise advice, Bernie? No, the, the, the box store stuff works pretty good, but it's important that you follow the instructions absolutely to the letter. Uh, it, it's uh, one of those things where uh, Amdro is, is really popular for ants. And Amdro works really great on, on the average ant. But you don't put it on top of the ant hill. Uh, that doesn't do any good. But if you sprinkle it around near the ant hill, the ants pick it up and take it back as a treasure. If you put it on the ant hill, they pick it up and, and throw it away because it's it's trash in in their living space. So, uh, you know, people that, that say Ambro is doesn't work aren't for the most part using it uh, in accordance with the instructions. So, uh, and and it's like all the rest of those things. The uh, label is the law. Follow the label. The, the companies that are selling this stuff spent millions of dollars of research to get it approved so they could sell it. And after they've done all that, if you're, you're like I am, you just go out and buy a package and you do whatever you feel like, and then you wonder why it doesn't work. And uh, 
about the third time I waste the money doing that, I'll read the instructions and I'll follow it and do it right. And it's amazing. When you do it right, it pretty much does what it's supposed to do. And that's the same way with, with the ant stuff. You know, th th these are smart little guys. They haven't existed for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, or thousands of years, maybe millions of years. Uh, being stupid, they, they have a, a drive to keep going. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you put the stuff down and, and it bothers them enough that they move somewhere else, you're getting to them. And it, it may take more than one application. It may take 10 applications, but uh, you're dealing with something that don't let it be smarter than you are. Keep it up. You know, the, the, there is definitely uh, ant bait that is that will work and uh, it will work if you follow the instructions, but you may have to do it more than once or twice. Just same way with uh, weed control. If you're doing weed control, uh, the, the first time you spray, you're not going to get rid of all the weeds. There's too many seeds and you can't get rid of them. So follow the directions. It will eventually work. And I know that there's new products on the market. Um, Amdro is probably the, the best known control for fire ants, and it can be effective. And they're making a lot of uh, newer formulations of fire ant baits that contain spinosad. Spinosad works very, very well on ants, apparently. So you can look around. Try looking online if your local big box store doesn't have enough of a selection. Try looking online. That's where I buy all my stuff from anymore. Amazon has everything, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. I think we're going to wrap it up here. And I know I'll be back next week. Bernie, you going to be here? I think I will. I think I will. Okay. Colby, you going to be here? I'm planning on it. Okay. We're all planning on it. So chances are if you tune back in at 10 o'clock, Next Thursday morning, you're going to find hopefully all three of us, but at least one of us here. So until then, thanks, everybody, so much for tuning in. And for everybody who's watching the recording of this, thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Feel free to reach out and get a hold of us, and we'll do our very best to help you out. And be sure to follow along with all of our upcoming classes and activities, and we're coming into fall gardening season beautiful time of year a little bit cooler now is when you can grow more than just sweet potatoes and okra coming up so um we'll see everybody back here again next week until then thanks so much bye guys